Good morning. That was pretty weak. Good morning. All right, not bad, General Thurman, not bad. If you're an old guy, you're doing okay. Well, we're, we're happy that, we're, that you're back and you made it through the evening. Sergeant Major retired Jim, Jimmy Spencer reports that there were uh, no serious incidents on the blotter last night. That's always good. Um, so we're, we're very happy. Uh, just uh, uh, again, a special shout out to BAE Systems for a wonderful opening reception last night. How about a round of applause for BAE Systems for last night? Well done. And for all of you who got uh, caffeinated this morning on on either flank of the of the uh, of the, the room this morning, thanks to Lockheed Martin for uh, their generous sponsorship of our coffee service this morning. Coffee is always good in the morning. Well done, Lockheed Martin. Uh, we've got, got to get a good agenda for us on day two here. Plenty of time for you to spend uh, on the exhibit floors in the East Hall, outdoors in the South Hall, to get the, to the Innovators Corner, to the Warriors Corner, uh, to the Civilian uh, 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 Professional Programs uh, sessions, uh, and, and many other events throughout the course of the day. So we look forward to that. Um, we've got a couple of events this morning. Uh, a couple of speakers in our first panel, and I would ask you after the first panel is uh, complete to, to, to remain in your place. We'll have an opportunity to honor the Army athletes of the year, and would uh, certainly welcome your uh, your support and attendance for that event as well. To get us kicked off this morning on day two is uh, General Bob Brown, he of the Sartorial Splendor, recognized uh, by General Wesley yesterday, uh, and for those of you who read the. The early morning news, you'll note that he was singled out, uh, not because of anything he did, but because of the uniform that he was wearing. Um, so it's, it's a, it's a, it is a very good thing. Uh, General Brown, as you all know, is the commanding general of the United States Army Pacific, uh, very focused on, on uh, an, an ever-increasing important theater for the United States Army. Many of you heard him speak uh, yesterday as a, as, a, as a panel member, uh, and General Brown's thoughts on uh, on multi-domain operations. He leads the cross-functional, he's the, the senior mentor for the cross-functional team for long-range precision fires. He's led the multi-domain task force in, in the Pacific and heavily invested in all of the Army's uh, modernization programs. Uh, great soldier and great leader, marginal basketball player. And uh, so please, please welcome the General Bob Brown. All right, well, good morning. Thanks, General Ham. I, I really appreciate it. You know, I was feeling pretty good uh, with the new uniform. You know how it is, you know. Uh, I was like, boy, I feel. But uh, then I realized uh, probably the number one comment was uh, folks thought it was my original uniform from back in World War II. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it makes you realize uh, you're, you're old, you know. So, uh, but I'm really, uh, really proud to be here. General Ham, thanks. Thanks for all you do. Uh, just incredible. Another uh, great. Uh, forum, and I'll tell you, the discussions are fantastic, the panels, and I'm really glad to be able to talk to you a little bit uh, about uh, what's going on in the Pacific and the focus of the whole conference, readiness and multi-domain operations. So talk a little bit about multi-domain operations. I would like to recognize all our distinguished guests, the uh, fellow general officers, uh, senior executive service, so many uh, key leaders, and then really thank industry for being here, whether you're a company of one or a few people or one of the larger uh, firms, you know, we cannot do it without you. And it is so great, that partnership. And I know there's debates going on about, you know, uh, uh, the, the amount of information, what it does. What it does is it allows our soldiers to have the best equipment in the world and maintain the peace and freedom uh, that is so critical protecting our nation. So we're just proud and thank you for being here and for the partnership because we cannot do it without you. And I'm awful proud as we look, uh, our soldiers have gotten the best equipment and uh, there's no doubt that would not happen without you. So thanks for being here and thanks for all you do to help our great soldiers protect our nation. Really appreciate it. So, you know, we've been focusing and talking a lot about the changing character of war uh, and uh, this, this uh, this change in uh, overwhelming amounts of complex en environment, overwhelming amounts of information. And we've been uh, very fortunate uh, to have been working on this for over two years now and looking at how do we uh, really apply this concept of multi-domain operations, take it from concept to doctrine. 
And I really want to share, you know, with you uh, uh, some of the key lessons we've learned in that, uh, the direction we're, we're headed, and then uh, as we look, uh, you know, what, what does that mean for the future? And uh, as we talked a little bit yesterday, uh, will we get to a joint, war, joint warfighting concept? So, you know, uh, also has come up quite a few times, there is no longer a phase zero. Uh, no, none of us ever liked that term anyway. It was implying that nothing was going on. But there were in the past times where, uh, you know, there, there wasn't a lot going on, little things going on. Now there, that, that is totally gone, and it's really uh, an area of continuous uh, geopolitical hyper-competition. And it's an incredible competition. I find in the Pacific, uh, Indo-Pacific region, uh, nowhere is, is uh, more competitive. This hyper-competition is happening across the board. Uh, the national defense strategy names, of course, uh, Russia and China uh, as our two biggest competitors. Uh, and uh, Henry Kissinger, an individual, knows uh, quite a bit about China. He, he stated, you know, the difference between China and Russia is that China has formidable strategic has a formidable strategic concept and the capacity to advance it over a long period of time. Uh, and though we are uh, in a state of 24/7 competition, you know, right in the national security strategy, it states that competition does not mean hostility, uh, nor does it have to. And I would submit, if we do competition right and we prepare properly, uh, we won't even get the conflict. Uh, which, which, of course, is the ultimate goal. Who would want conflict? That doesn't make any sense. And I go, go back to uh, what George Washington said, that to be prepared for war is one of the most effective means of preserving peace. And so uh, we must be prepared, but that'll help us uh, preserve the peace. There's no doubt about it. So being prepared for war now means embracing uh, this evolution in warfare has brought us to multi-domain operations. Uh, I talked about, uh, no question, it's an evolutionary concept. It has evolved. Air, land, uh, first air and maritime, really. I'm sorry, land and maritime, and then air came along, and as it evolves, now we have this thing, cyber, we have space, and uh, uh, continued, some would say, information operations as well. A domain, some would say, the human domain is also a key part of it, as you look at the impact on the human domain with, with this hyper-competition and the uh, complexity that's out there for sure. So uh, what we are learning is really changing how we should fight, and most importantly, how we train and how we prepare for the next fight. Uh, and again, by preparing, uh, maybe you avoid it completely. But it also uh, has implications of how we procure technology uh, and leverage advancement in order uh, to compete and deter. You know, the evolution from airland battle to multi-domain operations is really a mindset change. It is uh, definitely uh, going from what you would consider a more linear and predictable uh, effort that has been studied by our adversaries for a long time, and they feel they've broken the code on how to prevent that. So, you know, that's no longer sufficient. We can't do things uh, in service stovepipes anymore. Multi-domain operations and is first and foremost about joint integration. Uh, the good news is uh, we're as joint as any force in the world. The bad news is we're still not joint enough. I mean, we're, we're, we're interdependent in a joint manner. We depend on each other, but we have to be integrated. And uh, that's the steps we're taking. So, you know, the, the clear fact is we're no longer dominant uh, in, in all domains or in any of the domains at all times. And we used to be. If you look at the air domain, for example, the last uh, soldier uh, killed by enemy air was in 1953 in Korea, in 1953. Some of you talk about domination, but those, those periods of domination and domains are gone. Now we must look for periods of dominance, temporary periods of dominance uh, that we can leverage. So through multi-domain operations, we've learned that this thing, convergence, uh, is uh, the convergence of capabilities, absolutely a key concept as moving uh, into doctrine. It's a rapid, and continuous integration of capabilities uh, in all the domains. Uh, it optimizes the effects uh, to create an overmatch, and through cross-domain synergy and multiple forms of attack, it enab it's enabled by mission command and discipline initiative. And so this convergence is really maneuver in multiple domains, maneuver to a position of relative advantage. Again, not to not maneuver to close with and destroy the enemy, 
uh, but maneuver to put yourself in a position of advantage for temporary dominance uh, in that domain. So multi-domain operations allows us to preserve multiple options for our leadership, our commanders preserve those multiple options, present multiple options, and what commander doesn't want multiple options, and it also presents multiple dilemmas to an adversary. And again, who doesn't want to present multiple dilemmas, uh, not being as predictable, uh, but presenting multiple dilemmas uh, that cause them uh, uh, confusion and set them back and allow you temporary dominance uh, in certain domains. It also provides the joint commander uh, with the most options to be successful. So uh, when you look cyber and space, uh, when we look at domains, definitely present the most opportunities, but also the greatest challenges. As we're sorting through, uh, incorporating all domains in cyber and space in particular, the policies, the authorities, some of the challenges that we face, but there's incredible potential. And we look at how this affects training and this affects preparation. Uh, just imagine if, if cyber is not integrated into training anymore at all levels, well, you can fail in every domain. And this is something, you know, a few years ago we did not integrate it because quite honestly we all realized, hey, this is tough. This could bring us to our knees. This could cause problems. Well, now you've got to integrate it and you've got to look at how you adjust. Uh, and when we look at uh, incorporating Army joint and multinational capabilities uh, is absolutely key. And you get to a, what we would call a platform and sensor agnostic capability. So it doesn't matter what the sensor is out there whether it's a long-range reconnaissance, whether it's an F-35 uh, performing in a sensor role, whether it's uh, any type, any service of sensors, really a sensor agnostic, and then what platform engages the enemy is agnostic, and therefore you have lots of options uh, as you pull it together. And I would, I would also uh, emphasize that the difficult part is that's got to include our allies and partners. And I think at first, as we were going through this, we looked and, well, only those allies and partners that could be at that high level could participate. No, uh, what capability do they bring in multiple domains that can be an advantage? And in some cases, those allies and partners even have things we don't have. For example, uh, working with Japan, they have a SSM-12 land-based anti-ship missile already that the Army owns. So some cases they have capabilities we don't even have. And those allies and partners are a huge advantage something we have uh, that others don't uh, in, in the same manner, especially when you look at uh, China and Russia. They just don't have the allies and partners. Uh, and in the Pacific, we're very fortunate, five of our seven allies in the world are in the Pacific. So we're moving uh, very rapidly, again, from concept to doctrine, the uh, most rapid I've ever seen in 38 years. And uh, when you look at uh, how long it took, very similar period, post-Vietnam, air land battle, uh, 14 years from concept to doctrine. We don't have that kind of time. We've had to really work as a joint effort, working together to move faster from concept to doctrine. And really, as you look, it's, it's, uh, it's critical that it's a joint warfighting concept. It can't be a service stovepipe, uh, just won't work. It has to be a joint warfighting concept. Joint integration is really the key uh, and has to be the norm. Not something we do, something we do episodically, but something we do all the time. So some of these uh, multi-domain operations formations I'll talk about, uh, one is the multi-domain task force. Now the reality is all formations will have to become multi-domain or they'll be irrelevant in the future. And you can see a time where it'll be, uh, you know, a SBCT regular and SBCT multi-domain as their transition because it won't happen. It's going to be years for it to happen. And what capabilities or, or an ABCT that's, you know, regular ABCT and an ABCT multi-domain. And, and we don't know exactly what capabilities that will involve, uh, but we know it'll be, you know, you're going to have to have certain capabilities that you can think of some of the things like counter UAS. I mean, that's a no-brainer. You're going to have to, UAS is, is everywhere, unmanned aerial systems. You're going to have to be able to counter UAS, counter drone swarms and, and uh, those type of events. It's going to have to include cyber capabilities, electronic warfare, uh, the ability to command and control in multi-domain operations, whether that's a system or just a connection or, uh, uh, you know, the, but the ability uh, to link to those multi-domains is going to have to be in those formations. So uh, we're 24 months in, two years in, uh, to about a four-year effort as we're looking at this and working and, and leading the way and sharing everything that's coming out of this, by the way, across the Army and certainly 
uh, most importantly with U.S. Army Europe as they're working a similar effort with a multi-domain task force. Because it's, this is not a capability that's unique to the Pacific. It applies just as much uh, in Europe uh, against Russia because you have the same A2AD stand standoff, the same issues of the long-range precision fires. But we are finding that this multi-domain task force, uh, when it's uh, in operations, and we put it in operations, we put it in uh, use simulation, wargaming, and certainly exercises across the board for two years, uh, and it's an absolute game changer. It's like, you know, when General Hamm was talking basketball, it's March Madness right now. It's like getting Zion Williamson back, all right? Uh, that's a game changer, uh, no doubt about it. And uh, the last game, of course, Duke had no issues whatsoever. It was never in doubt. And, I, and I'm sure they'll go all the way here. Uh, I got them in my bracket going all the way, no doubt. So I wasn't, wasn't nervous at all the last game. But it is a game changer, the multi-domain task force, no doubt about it. So to illustrate that, let me show a, a quick uh, clip from a video. Uh, and uh, it'll give you a kind of an idea of what we've been doing and uh, some ideas on the multi-domain task force. The U.S. military is evolving to ensure it's ready to fight in this new environment. Its new doctrine, multi-domain operations, recognizes that future conflict must be met with seamless integration across the joint team. And it will not just occur on land, sea, and in the air, but it will include the space domain and cyber domain as well. It's an evolutionary process. Over time, we've had air, land, air, land, sea. We're evolving, but it's a revolutionary impact where you're maneuvering in all domains to a position of relative advantage. Maneuvering in cyber to a position of relative advantage pre-conflict. Maneuvering in, in space to a position of relative advantage. A missile launched from the land can uh, destroy a ship at sea, controlled by an army element, but using Navy, Air Force, Marine, some national satellite means, things never before used to pull it together. Now picture of that ship is trying to skirt into the littorals to avoid our strength at sea that our Navy, the best in the world, has. So they're, they're trying to skirt around it. Well, the Army can engage that ship now and destroy it, so now it has to go back out to sea and be right in our uh, engagement area where we're going to destroy it. So you're pairing up together all domains, maneuvering to a position of relative advantage in each domain, working together to create those windows of opportunity uh, where you can dominate your adversary. That gives you more options against an adversary. Anybody would want more options. It allows you to present multiple dilemmas to an adversary. And we're either going to do like we are now, innovate and move towards multi-domain operations uh, to either win a conflict in the future or prevent it because uh, nobody would be stupid enough to fight against us. Or we're going to be forced to do it because we lose someday pretty badly and we're going to have to do it. And I hope that's not the case. For the last several years, the Army has been leading this doctrinal evolution by piloting a multi-domain task force designed to enable the joint team. This is a tailorable, scalable unit which can be deployed by the combatant commander to synchronize and synergize joint capabilities. At its heart is the I2Q's detachment, intelligence, information, electronic warfare, and space. This element is comprised of four companies and can effectively penetrate an adversary's anti-access area denial shield, shape conditions in all domains, and open windows of opportunity for Navy, Air Force, Army, and Marine maneuver. Based on requirements, other capabilities can be snap-linked into the I2Qs. Long-range precision fires, security forces, logistics, air defense artillery, aviation, and engineers, making this a highly lethal, maneuverable organization. In exercises, the task force has demonstrated that it can enable Navy and Air Force maneuver in restricted terrain, create multiple options for the joint commander by coordinating targeting data and fires for all services and in all domains, and create multiple dilemmas for an adversary. Additionally, using denial and deception, the task force can camouflage its operations and confuse enemy sensors. It is a mobile and maneuverable organization. Nobody wants to fight. You know, the best thing would be, again, the deterrence where we never have to fight because nobody would be foolish enough uh, to go against us. So that, that's the best thing. So we've got a lot to connect, a lot of work to do, uh, pull all the pieces together. But if anybody can do it, uh, the United States military can. I feel very confident, and I'm very proud of the United States Army leading the way with multi-domain operations. So we just activated... Uh, a month ago, the first I2Qs, again, Intel, Information Ops, Cyber, Electronic Warfare and Space Battalion. 
with a space officer as the battalion commander. And this was at uh, JBLM. They're part of, they're, they're under the multi-domain task force. And it's pretty impressive when you look. So this has, again, been a pilot program. Where we've seen such success uh, that the Army was able to help us form a brand new battalion uh, from scratch. Not an easy thing to do. It's not like there's extra folks standing around. So, you know, really appreciate the tremendous support. And uh, what we're seeing with that is they must be present in the competition phase. That's when they can do their best work in the competition phase and set the stage that if you do go from competition to crisis, you are prepared in those domains I just mentioned. And those individuals, the brains uh, that you see there, I2Qs, we call the brains of the multi-domain task force, they're a higher level individual farther forward. So it's, it's not skill level 10. Uh, they're a higher level in those areas so they can take uh, action uh, and, uh, again, set the conditions if it does go to crisis or uh, conflict for certain. Uh, we've seen that's, that's absolutely key. And, uh, uh, you know, what it does is, quite honestly, we were not present in the competition phase, and certainly China and Russia are, as we know. So it's, it's, it's good to, uh, to be able to be there to make sure uh, you can compete and, and prepare for what may happen. And if you do it right, uh, you're going to have a huge advantage. So it, it truly is an Indo-Pacific, uh, as you can see in, in the video, the, a lot of water, a lot of other uh, services. It's a joint fight. There's no doubt about it. No one's saying it's a, it's a land only. It's all domains. It's a joint fight. And we don't have, you know, uh, weeks and months to form the team. We really have to do it in days and hours. It's one of the reasons for the first time ever right now we're undergoing, U.S. Army Pacific is undergoing four-star JTF certification uh, for a land four-star force. It only ever in the Pacific in history had only ever been at four-star level maritime. Uh, but again, things have changed. It used to be maritime could, uh, maritime and air uh, could uh, defeat uh, a threat from China. Uh, you know, of course, they'd want to fight joint, but they could do it mostly on their own. They can't anymore because of the A2AD, the Wall of Sams, the way the adversary uh, has developed. So uh, that's the reason, again, undergoing right now four-star JTF land certification. We've done three-star certification, certified a core, first core, uh, and, uh, but not at the four-star level. So uh, some of the key lessons we've learned as you look, again, as we're out there uh, with this, it, first and foremost is that it's not a strategic fire cell, the multi-domain task force. It must be able to maneuver uh, maneuver to a position of relative advantage. And in the Pacific, that's maneuver on uh, some of the 25,000 islands that are out there. They're key. Uh, and, uh, you know, when you look, uh, that ability uh, to move and maneuver to position of relative advantage is absolutely critical. Uh, they have to, we have to tailor and scale the capabilities based on the enemy and the environment. For example, you might say, well, of course, you'd always have security. Well, maybe a uh, host nation can provide security, and you wouldn't need that. Uh, maybe, you know, you would always need a certain capability. It might be provided by your allies and partners, and so you may not need it. You, know, you plan on it, you train for it, but it could be a different scenario depending on uh, where you are and, and, again, who's involved, that's for sure. And we're also finding that uh, land is enabling air and maritime, and, of course, that's along with space and cyber, as I mentioned, competing and assisting significantly, but the land enabling. And we, we go back to lessons, uh, you know, we don't, uh, you're, you're not going to ever fight the last war, but if you look back at lessons, certainly air and maritime enabled land in World War II, and everywhere we worked together, air, maritime, and land, it worked extremely well. When we didn't, we had major problems. Uh, when we worked together, it went very well. And now you could say it's, it's, it's evolved because of the threat from the adversaries, the long-range standoff they have, that A2AD umbrella, that now land, cyber, and space enable air and maritime. Uh, so it is uh, flipped and reversed. The other thing is uh, land is proving to be extremely survivable. And this is coming again, with, you know, th which is really no surprise, but it's interesting. And uh, we had a uh, briefing, an outside organization had done a study on this, and they said, you know, that land is more survivable and multi-domain operations worked. And, uh, 
and some of the, uh, when I was up at Indo-PACOM and, and some of the air and maritime, well, like, well, wait a minute, why, you know, why is that? And when you look at it, I mean, yeah, you can hide in the air, you can hide at sea, but it's much more difficult. Smaller formations dispersed is your best opportunity, but look at land. I mean, uh, land is extremely difficult. You can hide in a mega city, you can hide in a cave, you can hide in a valley, a jungle. I mean, land, for the same reason, it's much harder to communicate on land. Uh, it, it's easier to hide on land and survivability is greater as well as other things that uh, as you look at logistically you know, can have a much greater really an unlimited magazine depth if you uh, prepare properly and you preposition and you work the logistics aspects we're finding you, you can have virtually unlimited magazine depth and capacity that's proving to make a huge difference as well and you need it with the, uh, the uh, uh, robust arsenals that uh, those would do us harm have. Uh, also, long-range precision fires uh, are key, and thus the uh, priorities. And as General Ham mentioned, I'm uh, the senior mentor for long-range precision fires, and it's it's really impressive uh, what's happening there, both you know, in rocket, missile, and uh, cannon, and uh, everything from the strategic long-range cannon uh, to the precision strike missile to uh, cross-domain attack. Comes, I mean, on and on and on. I could go on for hours about that, but that effort is really key. And uh, having those long-range precision fires makes a huge difference. And again, positioned and able to maneuver in, uh, uh, in the Pacific in one of 25,000 islands is, is a game changer as well. If you just think about uh, land-based anti-ship missiles as well, what that can do. Uh, you kind of saw that working together and, and uh, th that you can force the enemy into an area they don't, essentially force them into a kill zone where we have the advantage. Additionally, uh, think about denying access to straits, something we haven't thought about, but you have, you know, straits that are key terrain, maritime terrain, very restricted, very important, and you can den deny access from land if you have the right capabilities. Uh, and again, that presents multiple dilemmas to an adversary, something they're uh, not used to and uh, definitely causes them some challenges. We're also seeing it's really essential uh, something we've been good at for a long time, and we kind of lost a little bit, denial and deception operations. You think back to, I mean, you can go back to Desert Shield, Desert Storm, the Marines and the, and the efforts there uh, that worked so well, and a uh, li little bit of deception. I mean, you can go back to the Revolutionary War, where a nighttime bayonet attack was really a, a, a form of deception, unexpected by the enemy in every, you know, Patton's army in World War II. We're going to need that denial and deception. We can't be so predictable. We're going to need, in some cases, you're going to try to hide stuff, but it's very hard to hide today, although it's technology, it helps you a little bit with that. In other ways, you're going to try to saturate. Like, for example, if you could have a device about the size of this water bottle, and you have 10,000 of them out there that are emitting a radar from, that, that uh, uh, makes it look like it's a tippy-2 radar, and there's 10,000 of them, good luck finding the actual tippy-2 and wasting all that time doing it. So a little different denial and deception, and we're finding that is absolutely critical uh, and increases survivability significantly. When you look also, uh, uh, there's no question that, that uh, information ops is absolutely critical, and that was added, a lesson learned. We didn't originally have it in the uh, IQs formation in the MDTF, and we realized, you know, it was one of those things. We knew it was important. We thought, well, it's everywhere. Well, but, but you've got to... Uh, get it in there and work it, and information ops is absolutely key, pulling all that, those aspects together in the competition phase again, and uh, the ability to bring you, uh, when you're in crisis, back to competition, and those key as aspects uh, information operations can do. We've also learned that, uh, obviously, convergence and this maneuver in multiple domains can affect the enemy's A2AD umbrella that they have, uh, but also what happens is you create your own A2AD AD umbrella, a little a bubble, we call it, that develops that's very useful, and we found that uh, we didn't expect that, uh, but in exercises, uh, every domain is taken advantage of this localized A2AD AD umbrella that you can form, again, that can maneuver, it's not stationary, and, and it can be survivable, and it's very effective for maneuvering multiple domains, a big advantage. Uh, also, we found that uh, Allies and partners have a much bigger role than, you know, it's, we have to because you never want to, we're not going to do anything alone. You're going to do stuff with your allies and partners. And how do they fit in? If maybe they can't have an entire multi-domain task force, but what aspect of that do they bring? And it's many cases, it's, it's a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, your allies and partners have uh, great capabilities. For example, some of our uh, close allies and partners in the uh, Pacific have 864 Echo Apaches. 
very useful in many scenarios. They have, as I mentioned, long-range precision fires, or some cases, uh, capabilities that we don't have, and on and on. So that, that can be extremely uh, useful, and certainly incorporating that almost uh, it gives you a huge advantage, there's no doubt about it. And we're, we're also uh, seeing some challenges. Again, don't want to paint that it's all a rosy picture and there's no issues. Of course there's issues. That's why it's a concept and not already doctrine. And some of those challenges, you know, authorities is really key because it's, this is different. And we've seen authorities change over the last 10, 15 years significantly. You know, we used to be very clear cut, uh, you know, in, in command relationships, TACON, OPCON, ADCON, whatever. They, and now it's really supported and supporting. And it's the same way in authorities. Who has the authority if you're using uh, multiple sensors and platforms? Who has the authority and where does the buck stop for who authorizes uh, those lethal fires uh, or non-lethal fires, uh, whatever the case may be, those authorities are wrestling through those. But what we're uh, finding is if we let the authorities stop us, we won't move forward. We've got to move forward, work it, and figure out the authorities, not let it stop us. That's kind of what we've done in the past. We, we'll say, well, we can't use cyber because we don't have the authorities. Well, have we checked? Have we worked it? Have we pushed it? Have we asked? Have we figured out what authorities we need? It may be a reach-back capability for authorities. It may be authority we have, uh, and we just have to work that uh, the right time and the right level. We also, uh, you know, multi-domain ops, command and control. You can imagine command and control is difficult in a single service. It's difficult joint. You can imagine a multi-domain going back and forth, and one of the things that's missing and people are working it across the board is this common operating picture. I mean, how do you see all domains without it just overwhelming you uh, and, and how do you get a good picture? Connecting all those systems that were not designed to connect. They were kind of designed usually in service stovepipes, and now you're trying to connect them. In some ways, it's easier to start over uh, and connect them you know, from scratch. In other ways, you can adjust and, and uh, develop ways to connect them with systems that already exist. But it's absolutely key. If you don't have that common operating picture, you don't have a good feel for what's going on uh, and what the situation is, and that's certainly not a good thing. That's a challenge. Uh, and we've got to fight through the tendency to have a service solution only, a single service solution, uh, which is the way we all kind of grow up. You grow up, and you, even though we're uh, gold, water, nickels, and we're joint, you still think of your own service solution. It's just natural. We've got to get to that the joint solution is really key. Uh, and then uh, I think it's also important, uh, another thing, uh, another challenge is bringing, you know, we, we don't certainly never would want to leave allies and partners behind and move so rapidly they can't keep up, or you know we're investing so much they can't keep up with the investment, they can't keep up with it, and so how do they fit in? And we really look at it as if you do it right, it's a 10x factor. You know, it's 10 times when you have those allies and partners are advantage, and everything they bring to it can be a huge factor against any adversary. Uh, can you imagine the strength of an MDO-capable coalition, for example? Who would want to go against that? If you're truly multi-domain ops capable and you can present those multiple dilemmas and you can do uh, those, those key interactions in a, in a coalition form, that's going to be incredibly powerful. Uh, but we've got to sort through how to do that and ensure uh, we're taking advantage. You know, the other aspect uh, the, 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 uh, uh, is we have a huge advantage, and this is, uh, the, you know, uh, in our people. Uh, the people... For us, particularly uh, when you look uh, in the U.S. military and all the services have, you know, empowerment in some form or another, we switched in 2008 to Mission Command, realizing uh, that we must leverage the power of our people. And you can't, um, you know, command and control may have worked in the past. It's too slow. And you need Mission Command empowerment and leaders that you develop, not that are comfortable, in ambiguity and chaos, but that can thrive. Trusted teams of professionals that can thrive in ambiguity and chaos. That's a huge advantage, absolutely huge advantage that we have. And so there's no question we've got to leverage that. And I really, uh, we appreciate the tremendous work from TRADOC and Steve Townsend and truly getting at Mission Command. And we work that every single day in this effort. Again, as you look at the authorities, empowering as much as possible uh, because it won't work without that, but the good news is we can do it. You can only do multi-domain operations if you can empower your people and use uh, myth mission command. Otherwise, it's just not going to work. So we look at all of this, and uh, the goal would be, you know, as we looked at, uh, again, we'd never have to fight. You know, there would be such a deterrent. If you look back, uh, similar to, you know, fighting outnumbered 
and winning in, uh, in, in uh, Europe against the Soviets. Again, I go back to uh, how old I am as a company commander when we were working air land battle in the Folder Gap. Uh, but, but it worked. You know, the effort that we had in air land battle prevented us from ever having to fight, and, and we won uh, that Cold War, if you will. Well, the same deterrence is, is possible today if we can truly get to multi-domain operations. Deterrence being the capability, we have to have the capability. Deterrence being the resolve, we clearly have to have the resolve. And then the signaling. You're signaling to your adversary as well. What do you reveal and conceal? Uh, so the capability, resolve, and signaling get you that deterrent factor that's so key. And if we work this right, we, we will have that. So it's a very exciting time. Lots of challenges, but incredible opportunities. Again, uh, we can't do any of this without your help and the great partnership and teaming. And we've been very fortunate to be able to bring lots of ideas forward and pilot them, both through uh, OSD SCO, uh, the Army RCO, uh, and lots of other uh, quick reaction tests and everything else. And we welcome, I uh, hope to see you out in the Indo-Pacific and come forward with those capabilities. And we can get them in an exercise and operation and use them. And that's why I'm so glad you're here and we have the opportunity to explain to you the direction we're going because it'll only help move us forward and it's key to success. Clearly a joint concept, uh, but multi-domain operations is key for the future. So I look forward to questions. We have, I think, about 10 minutes left or so for questions, uh, and I'm sure there'll be some good ones heading my way shortly. Thanks very much. Promise me all easy questions, a bunch of softballs here. So. Well, it talks about uh, considering multi-domain operations. What do you envision the role of the National Guard? Uh, considering the limited training opportunities and state mission sets, will Guard members expect a significant increase in training time away from the state? Well, first of all, we're a total army, uh, and I'm really proud. Uh, we've had National Guard. Last year, we had National Guard lead. Pacific Pathways for the first time ever, and it was incredibly successful, the Indiana Guard. And as we look, we have in every exercise, in every operation, in every war game, everything we do, we have Guard and Reserve in it because we can't do our mission without it. We're a total army, no doubt about it. There certainly will be, I'm not sure I would consider it an increase in cha training. I would say the basics have changed, and I think the readiness panel this afternoon will talk a little bit about that. You know, for example, as the example I gave, if you, you could, you know, years ago, you didn't have to incorporate cyber in anything. You didn't have to worry about it. Now, if you don't incorporate it in your training, in the basics even, uh, you, you, you could fail at every mission you have. So, uh, and I don't think that I think we'll figure out a way uh, where it doesn't mean a significant time away from the state and multi-domain operations. There'll be uh, tremendous ways that the Guard, the Reserves uh, can contribute and do contribute and we work, you know, we're sensitive like in that pathways. We figured out how to do it where they were gone an extended amount of time, but it wasn't the same unit gone. We rotated and we, and we, uh, we worked through it. So uh, clearly Guard and Reserve will be a key part of multi-domain operations. It will change how they train. Uh, but they'll be able to handle it, and I think what we'll find is they'll, uh, there'll be uh, relationships like through the state partnership program that will be greater than any other relationships we have that will help us in multi-domain operations in ways we never imagined. Uh, let's see, General Michael Hayden said in a speech in Huntsville, uh, if we get the relationship with China right this century, everything else will fall in place. If we get it wrong, nothing else will matter. What will help us get the China relationship right? Whew, it's about a two-hour answer. Uh, I will say I feel very fortunate. I've had uh, multiple trips to China. I uh, got to study uh, China and go for two weeks when I was at National War College and have been in the Pacific, gosh, for uh, 30 years now dealing with China, over, over 30 years, about geez, 18, 20 years worth of assignments in the Pacific. So I've seen a significant change in China. Uh, they have a you know strategy that's right out there you can look at, and they have a, a goal, and they are investing like crazy, uh, and really uh, there's a hyper competition, and you see it the one belt one road, there's the one belt one road also the the uh, road that goes through the Arctic, the land one belt one road, and the maritime, and uh, what I think is uh, is interesting is when I used to go around the Pacific uh, about two years ago go around the Pacific, and over the past ten years. 
Uh, I would always bring up China, and usually most nations would say, yeah, yeah, you know, they're out there, and they're going to, you know, we're all tied to them economically, and nobody wants to fight China. That'd be crazy. But there is a competition going on, and a hyper-competition. And uh, what's happened recently is they've been overly aggressive. And now nations will bring up to us. All, every nation I go to throughout the Pacific will say, China's being so aggressive, uh, they realize they're, uh, they'll come in with bags of money and there's no strings attached, but there are strings attached. There's the debt trap diplomacy uh, that uh, many folks have realized. And they will bring up to us how frustrated they are is they will come in with no strings attached, but then they'll start demanding. You will do this, you will do this. And it's pretty obvious uh, that uh, they have an ulterior motive and the nations are figuring that out. And I think you, you see China sort of slowing down a little bit because they realize they've been so aggressive. Uh, but I think what's important is I would much rather deal with China from a position of strength than a position of weakness. And uh, I think that will be much more effective when you look at certainly uh, we want to work closely with China, together with China, uh, but their aggressiveness sometimes really makes you question, like I could show you pictures of an island in the South China Sea that was a rock sticking above the ground five years ago and now has a runway, uh, surfaced air missile sites, barracks. Uh, it's unbelievable when you look uh, at, at about seven of the uh, that weren't islands that are now islands. And even though uh, the, the President Xi says, well, we will not militarize them, they're clearly militarized. And so you just have to wonder, what, you know, okay, what's going on here? And uh, very, very interesting. So we got to keep working with them. We do the largest exercise, uh, U.S. Army Pacific does, a disaster management exchange with China every year. I think that's a very good thing. Humanitarian assistance, disaster response. Of the 36 nations in the Pacific, 35 out of 36 work together closely to save lives because 7 out of 10 lives lost in the world in a disaster are lost in the Pacific. Uh, unfortunately, with the rim of fire and all that goes on. Uh, so the only one that doesn't work right now is North Korea. Maybe they will someday. Uh, but so that's a good thing, and, uh, and you can move the relationship forward. Uh, but, but there's, uh, again, uh, incredible aggressiveness like I've never seen. So the real concern, I'd rather deal from a position of strength. But I do agree with General Hayden. We've got to get it right. That's for sure. Uh, next question is, how has the increase in standoff capabilities changed force ratio requirements in the attack? Do you, uh, do you have to integrate new domains into force ratio calculations? Absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I, I think it's completely changed that ratio when you look at long range precision fires and standoff. And uh, a calibrated force posture is a part of multi domain operations, and that is critical. Calibrating that force posture, and it is different. And it is different because in some cases, you're going to have to maneuver with, uh, if, if you get in a fight, maneuver uh, and go against enemy. In other cases, you're going to maneuver to position a relative advantage where you leverage long range capabilities. So that changes those force ratios. Uh, and I would just say that uh, uh, working with multiple domains changes that. And uh, so that's, that's a, you answered your own question there, very good question, and then you pretty much answered it uh, very well. Okay, next is, uh, and the last question, changing and creating new policies and authorities to enable MDO, especially in the competition phase, is key. What policy or authority issues have you experienced, and who in the Army is responsible? And this is one of the challenges. Uh, very good question. Who the heck is responsible? I'm, I'm blaming Gus. You know, I'll just uh, blame Gus or Mike Murray. Uh, but, uh, no, uh, one of the challenges is we don't know what policies to ask uh, to be adjusted because what we did for years was just say, oh, we don't have those authorities, like, say, in cyber. Uh, we were doing an exercise with Australia. And we are trying to, Australia has a FATIDS, uh, you know, digital fire system, and we have it. So you figure, okay, that's easy. Well, lo and behold, we get there, and we realize there's a policy uh, that we can't directly link them, even though they have the same system we do, and they're an ally. We didn't even know there was a policy. Now, you know, again, we found out. We got it wavered and adjusted, but part of the challenge is finding out what's out there, because in some cases, we've never tried to do some of this stuff, particularly in cyber and space. And so sometimes you just have to ask, find out what the policy is and why, and then if you can show, uh, if you have the authority to do that, 
uh, and you know, and you can have a tremendous result. Usually, they'll they'll adjust the policy and you know keep you. Uh, you're not going to uh, in cyber let you shut off the entire grid system of country or anything. It'll keep you in a in a, a restricted form. But you have that authority if you ask for it. So part of it, as we're going through this, is figuring out what the policies are, and it's a variety. There's not one person. I wish there was one person to go to. You say change all those policies. That's one of the other challenges. It's spread out all over. So you have to figure out what they are, uh, work through it, and then you can uh, make progress. That's the only way, kind of push the system and not just say, in the past we used to just say, well, the policy says we can't do that, so we can't do that. But uh, in the future, we need to adjust or we will not be able to do multi-domain ops and we won't be successful. So uh, great questions. Thanks very much. And uh, really appreciate the attention, especially first thing in the morning. Obviously, the coffee bars worked. We put double espresso in those things so you'd stay awake and, uh, and, and, it, uh, and it worked. So thanks for the attention. And uh, again, great to see you here, and thanks for joining us. Good. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, General Brown, and, and thanks for all that you and U.S. Army Pacific are doing to help move the Army's operating concept from concept uh, uh, toward doctrine. And if you want to learn more about uh, what the Army in the Pacific is doing, join us 21 through 23 May in Honolulu. Uh, for uh, for uh, the Land Pack uh, Symposium, 21 to 23 May.